Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is the first video about the new series of Arch Linux installation. So we are going to do them now more modular. This is the first video and it's going to cover the base install until the graphic cards. And in the next video, I'm going to do the same for the MVR systems. And then I'm going to do videos about desktop environments. So you can basically watch one of the base system depending on the computer you have. And then you can choose your desktop environment and watch that video as well. This way it's easier for me to make the videos and it's easier also to cover more content and it's easier for you to decide which desktop environment you want to use. So let's get started. So here we go, I downloaded the ISO. By the way, since a few days there is a new image on the Arch Linux website and it has the date of the 1st May 2020. So we can go ahead here and we can select the first option to boot up the ISO. And it's going to take a moment here to boot up the system. So we'll meet back at the login prompt. So there you go. We are now at the login prompt. What I did now is to go through SSH to my bigger terminal here so that I can increase the font size and you can see better. So we can proceed by installing now the base system. So the first thing you might want to do if you don't have a US keyboard is to load your key map. The Arch Linux ISO boots normally with the US keyboard layout. So if you don't have one, you need to tell the system which keyboard you're using. So to do this, we'll type in locale ctl list dash key maps, then a space and then a pipe symbol. And then we use the grep function to narrow down the search. So my keyboard is a Swiss keyboard and it has the connotation ch. So I'll type in here ch capital letters because that's the connotation. You can replace, of course, this with the connotation of your keyboard. And then we just press enter. So as you can see here, we get a list of results. And the one I'm looking for is the first one, DE underscore CH dash lating one. So I need to put this in the system. And to do this, we can type in load keys and then the string we found. So in my case, it's DE underscore CH dash lating one, and hit enter. And there you go. And now my keyboard is fully functional. So we can clean up the terminal. Now we need to check for an internet connection. So let's type in IP space A and hit enter. So I have an internet cable connected to my computer. That's why I have an IP here ending with 126, which is connected to the internet interface. If you have a cable, you have an IP as well already here. If you have Wi-Fi, we need to now type in Wi-Fi dash menu. And when you hit enter, you will see a list of networks. You can select yours, enter the password, and you'll be connected as well. Now, if you have a problem running this command here and some error comes up, that means the system didn't load the correct drivers. So in this case, we need to find out first which wireless card we have. So let's delete the command here. And we can type in LSPCI dash VNN, then space, and then dash D, then a space again, and then 14E4, and then a colon. When you hit enter, then you will see the name of your graphic card. And then you can determine which driver you might need. For this, I refer you also to the Arch Wiki because I cannot demonstrate this in the tutorial. One of the most common problems with Wi-Fi cards is because it's using the Broadcom proprietary drivers. And let me show you where you can find this information. So I'll go down to the browser here. So what I noticed in my experience is that sometimes I need to blacklist some of these drivers here and boot up from the ISO so that the correct driver is going to be loaded in the system and the Wi-Fi card is recognized. Once this is done and you are able to install the system the first time, you also have to install in this case the Broadcom-VL driver which will provide the proprietary drivers for your Broadcom card. There is no one solution for everything, and for every Wi-Fi card, troubleshooting will be a little different, but you'll find the needed information always on the ArchWiki. And if you have any questions about it, you can drop a comment down below, and I'll do my best to help you out. So let's close this up, and we delete this command here. So now that we have an IP, we can clean up the terminal. And the first thing we need to do is to synchronize the network time protocol. So to do this, we'll type in time date CTL set dash NTP and then true and hit enter. And let's clean up the terminal. So now that we have an internet connection, let's take care of our mirror list. The first thing we need to do is to synchronize first our servers. So let's type in pacman dash S Y Y Y and hit enter. Now, in order to have the best servers available to download packages, I want to install a package called Reflector. So let's do this by typing in pacman s and then Reflector and hit enter. Let's proceed with installation here by hitting enter. 
and reflector is installed. Now let's clean up the terminal and use reflector to create our mirror list. So let's type in reflector, then dash C for the country. The country I mean right now is Switzerland, so I'll type in Switzerland. And then dash A for the age of the server. So that means since how many hours the server has been updated. In my case, I'm going to go with six hours. I wouldn't suggest you go less than six hours because you might not find any server available. And then I'll type in dash dash sort because I want to sort these servers by rate, which means by download speed. And then I'm going to type in dash dash save because I need to save this information in our mirror list directory, which is slash Etsy slash pacman dot D slash mirror list and hit enter. And there you go. Now let's refresh our servers again by typing in pacman dash S Y Y Y and hit enter. And now we have the best servers available to us. So let's clean up the terminal and let's take care of our disk. Let's type in lsblk. And as you can see here in this virtual machine, I have a disk called VDA. Now this is the name of my disk. Your disk might be different. It might be SDA, or if you have an NVMe drive, it might be NVMe zero and one. It really depends on how your system is configured. So in this tutorial, everything which has VDA in it, you will have to replace it with your disk. So the first step here is to partition the disk. And this is a UEFI system. So we have to partition the disk at least with two partitions which are mandatory. One is the EFI partition, and the second mandatory partition is the root partition. There is an optional home partition that you can create. And if you want to, you can also create a swap partition. In my case, I choose not to do this because I will create later a swap file. The advantage of the swap file is that you can delete it and recreate it anytime you want. While with the swap partition, this is a little bit more tricky, and this is why I'm choosing to do a swap file here. If you have an MBR system, which we are going to look in the next video, that would be a little different because normally systems which have less resources, namely less RAM, might need a swap partition in order to improve the system performance in that the swap partition will help in this case when the PC has less memory to deal with data. In my case here, as I said, I will create a swap file later. So I can go ahead now and partition the disk with one EFI partition and a root partition. So to do this, we'll type in fdisk, our partitioning program, and then the disk path, which is slash dev slash VDA, and hit enter. Now this is a UEFI system and we need to create a GPT label for this disk. So I'll type in here G and hit enter, and the GPT label has been created. Now let's go ahead and create the first partition. Let's type in N for new and hit enter. Now we need to give a partition number, the default is one, which is fine with me. So I'll just hit enter here. The first sector as a default is 2048, which is fine. So I'll hit enter here too. And the last sector here defines basically the size of the partition. So I want the EFI partition to be 200 megabytes. So I'll type in plus 200 and a capital M and hit enter. Now it created a partition with a Linux file system type. We can change this by typing in T for type because we need to tell the system this is a EFI partition. And if you don't know the type of the partition, you can type in here capital L and hit enter. And we have a list here of partition types. We'll see the number one is the one we are looking for. So EFI system. So let's hit Q here to leave the list and type in now the partition type we want. So one in this case and hit enter. Now let's clean up the terminal first and proceed by creating the second partition. So let's type in N for new and hit enter. Partition default number two is fine, so I hit enter here. First sector is also fine, so I'll hit enter. And here we need to decide how big this root partition is going to be. So you have two choices here. You can make your root partition, for example, say 30 gigabytes or 40 gigabytes, depending on the size of your disk, and then go ahead and create a third partition, which is gonna be your home partition or you can give the root partition the rest of the disk and just have one partition overall. Now, the advantage of having also an extra home partition is that if something happens to the system one day and you need to reinstall it, you can do so by booting from the Arch ISO and installing the system into the root partition and your personal data in the home partition will be still intact. 
Of course, this depends also on your workflow, how you save your data. In my case, for example, I don't need to have a home partition because I save always my data on an external server, but your case scenario might vary, so you can decide accordingly. If you decide to create a home partition here, you need to give a size to the root partition first and then follow the same procedure by creating also the home partition. In my case here for the last sector, I'm going to accept the default because I want to use the whole disk. So I just hit enter. And then the partition 2 has been created as a Linux file system and that's fine. And this is going to be the same also for the home partition if you decide to do that. So now that we made those changes to the disk, we need to write those changes to the disk. So let's type in W and hit enter and the partition table has been written to the disk. So we can now clean up the terminal and type again lsblk. And we can see now we have VDA1, in your case it might be SDA1, or NVMe 0 and 1 P1. In my case it's VDA1, 200 megabyte, this is our EFI partition, and VDA2, it's our root partition. So let's format these partitions now. Let's begin with VDA1. We need to format this as a FAT file system type because it's an EFI partition. So let's type in mkfs for make file system dot fat. Now we need to define which fat file system we want to give to this partition. And it has to be a fat32 file system. So we'll type in dash capital F32. And then the partition path. So slash dev slash VDA1. And hit enter. So this is done. Now let's format our root partition by typing in mkfs dot. Now we need to decide which file system we want to use here. It can be ext4, it can be zfs, it can be badrefs. In this tutorial, I'm going to use ext4 because this is the most used file system type still. I will make another tutorial in the future for the base install with the badrefs file system and also the zfs file system. But in this case, I'm going to type in ext4 and then our partition path. So slash dev slash vda2 and hit enter. And there you go. Let's clean up the terminal and type in again lsblk. And now we need to mount these partitions. So first, let's mount our root partition. And our root partition, we can mount it with this command. Mount partition path slash dev slash VDA2 space. And then we need to define in which directory we want to mount this partition. And that is our installation directory, which is slash mount. And hit enter. Now we need to mount the EFI partition VDA1 into the boot directory in our new system, which is not existing yet. So we need to create that first. So let's create the boot directory by typing in mkdir, then slash mount, which is our installation directory. And then the partition we want to create is slash boot, and hit enter. Now we can mount VDA1 into this boot directory by typing in mount partition path slash dev slash VDA1 our directory is slash mount slash boot and hit enter. Now, if you created a home partition before, you need to create here also a home directory. And to do this, you would do exactly the same process. You would type in mkdir slash mount slash home, and then you would mount the home partition by typing in mount slash dev slash vda3, in my case, slash mount slash home. So in my case, this is fine because I don't have a home directory. So we can proceed by cleaning up the terminal and typing again lsblk to see our mount points. So you can see here we have VDA1, which is mounted under slash mount slash boot, and VDA2 mounted under slash mount. So now that we mounted the partition, we can proceed by installing the base system. So we'll do this by typing in packstrap. Then we need to define the installation directory, which is slash mount, and then the packages we want to install. So in my case, I want to install base, and then Linux, which is going to install the latest Linux kernel. You can also install the LTS version if you want by typing in Linux-LTS. And then I want to install also Linux-Firmware. And if you have an Intel processor, I definitely recommend you to install Intel-Ucode, which is going to provide some extra firmware for your processor. And if you have an AMD processor, you can replace this with AMD-Ucode. In my case, because I'm on a virtual machine, I don't need to install this, but I need to install also an editor, which in my case is going to be nano. And then we can hit enter. So here it's going to take some time to download and install the packages, and I'll be back when it's done. So there you go, the packages are now installed, so I can clean up the terminal. 
So now that we installed the base packages, we need to generate the fstaf file, which is the file system table where all our mount points will be included. So to do this, we'll type in gen fstaf and then dash capital U because we want to generate this using the UUID of the partitions and then slash mount. And we're going to append this information here by typing twice the major than symbol to slash mount slash Etsy slash fstab and hit enter. Now let's have a look at the content of the fstab file shortly. Let's type in cat slash mount slash Etsy slash fstab and hit enter. So you can see here we have VDA2, which is our root partition with its UUID, the mount point, file system type, options and file system checks and the same goes for VDA1 our EFI partition. So everything looks good and we can clean up the terminal. Now we can leave the ISO installer and move into the installation itself by typing in arch dash root and then slash mount and hit enter. So you can see now also the login prompts change. We are now in the root installation and not anymore in the ISO installer. So let's clean up the terminal and now it's a good time to create a swap file. So let's type in f allocate for file allocate dash l for length or size. So I'm going to create a swap file and I want to make it two gigabytes. So I'll type in two GB. You can give more if you want to. And then slash swap file and hit enter. Now we need to change the permissions of the swap file so that it can be read. So we'll type in chmod 600 and then slash swap file and hit enter. Now let's make the swap by typing in mkswap slash swap file and hit enter. And now we can activate the swap by typing in swap on slash swap file and hit enter. Now we need to put the swap file also in the fstab file. So to do this, we'll type in nano slash etsy slash fstab and hit enter. We go down to the empty space here and we define the swap file. So we'll type in slash swap file its name. The mount point is none, as it doesn't have any. The file system type is swap. The options are defaults. And the file system checks are zero and zero. And then we hit control O and enter to save the file and control X to exit the editor. Now let's clean up the terminal and take care of our localization stuff. And first we go with the time zone. So we need to find out which time zone we need to tell the system. So to do this, we can type in time date CTL list dash time zones space and then a pipe symbol then we're going to use the grep function again to narrow down the search so i'll type in grep and i'm going to search this by city so i know the city closest to me is zurich so i'll type in zurich here and hit enter and as you can see i get only one result and this is the one i need to tell the system so let's do this by typing in ln dash sf we are creating here a soft link and then slash user slash share slash zone info slash the string we found as a result. So in my case is Europe slash Zurich. And we are going to link this information to slash Etsy slash local time and hit enter. Now we can synchronize the hardware clock to the system clock and we'll type in HW clock space dash dash sys to HC and hit enter. There you go. Let's clean up the terminal and work on our locale.gen file. So let's type in nano slash etsy slash locale.gen and hit enter. Now here we need to scroll down to find our locale. So you can choose as many locales as you want to, but in my case, I just need English US. So I'll scroll down until I find it right here. And I need to take the one which has the line UTF-8 and we need to uncomment this line here by deleting the hashtag. And then we hit the control O and enter to save the file and control X to exit the editor. Now we can generate the locales by typing in locale-gen and hit enter. Now we need to put also this locale string in our locale.com file. To do this, I'm gonna use the echo command. So we can type in echo, double quote, lang, all capital letters, equal, the string we found before, so in my case is en underscore us dot utf dash eight, double quotes, and then we append this information to slash etsy slash locale dot conf and hit enter. Now, if you choose a different key map at the beginning of the video, we need to put this also in the vconsole.com file. So we'll do this by typing in echo 
double quote again, then key map, all capital letters, equal the key map we chose before. So in my case, it was DE underscore CH dash Latin one, double quote, and then we append this information to slash Etsy slash vconsole.conf and it enter. Now let's clean up the terminal and work on our host name. So let's type in nano slash Etsy slash host name and it enter. Here you can basically choose a name for your machine. So I'll call mine Arch UEFI and then I hit Ctrl O and enter to save the file and Ctrl X to exit the editor. And now we can work on the hosts file. So we'll type in nano slash Etsy slash hosts and hit enter. We scroll down to the empty space and type our IPv4 address, which is 127.0.0.1 tab and then localhost. Then the next line is colon colon one, the IPv6 address, and then tab tab and then localhost again. And in the last line is 127.0.1.1 and then a tab again and then our host name. In my case, it's arch UEFI dot local domain, a tab again, and then our host name again. So arch UEFI. And then control O and enter to save the file and control X to exit the editor. Now we can give the root user a password. So let's type in pass WD and hit enter. Type in the new password and retype it. There you go. Now it's time to install the grub bootloader and some other packages. So let's clean up the terminal first. And let's type in pacman dash s and then grab our bootloader then it's a ufi system so we have to install also efi boot mgr then i want to install some networking tools the first one is network manager the second tool is network dash manager dash applet then some wireless packages the first one is wireless underscore tools and also WPA underscore supplicant. And I want to install also dialog. And OS Prober. If you decide to install here another system one day, this might be useful. And then two packages for working with FAT file system types. One is mTools and the other one is DOS FS Tools. And I want to install also two development packages, which I'm always going to need. One is base dash devil. And the other one is Linux dash headers. If you install the Linux LTS kernel, you might want to install here the Linux headers LTS package. They have to match these two packages in order to work. And then I want to install also some packages for our Bluetooth services. So the first one is blues and also blues dash utils. And I want to install also our printing system, which is cups. And I want to install also Git. We are going to need Git in order to install Yay to install packages from the Arch user repository. And let's take care also of our sound system. So let's type in Pulse Audio. And another package would be Pulse Audio dash Bluetooth. We can install also Pulse Audio dash Alsa to be able to manage the Alsa system already built into the kernel. And I'll install also Pulse Audio dash equalizer and also pulse audio dash jack and the last two packages i want to install are xtg dash utils and xtg dash user dash dears to create user directories and then we can just hit enter accept the default here by hitting enter and proceed with installation now by hitting enter so it's going to take a moment here to download and install the packages and i'll be back when it's done there you go, the packages are now installed so we can clean up the terminal. And now it's time to install grub. But first let me type in again lsblk because I wanna have my boot partition in front of me, which if you remember is VDA1 and it's mounted under slash boot. So let's install grub now by typing in grub dash install, then dash dash target to define the target machine equal this is a 64-bit machine, so we'll type in x86 underscore 64 dash EFI. Then we need to define the EFI directory, so we'll type in dash dash EFI dash directory. Equal, we have it right here, so we'll type in here slash boot. And then we define the bootloader ID, so we'll type in dash dash 
bootloader-id equal grub. And then we can hit enter. There you go, the installation is done. No error reported. So we can proceed now by generate the configuration file for grub. So we'll type in grub-mkconfig-o. So we put the output of the configuration file under slash boot slash grub slash grub dot cfg and hit enter. And grub is now correctly installed. So let's clean up the terminal and enable our services. So let's do this by typing in system ctl enable. First one is network manager so that we have internet when we boot up the machine. So let's type in network manager and hit enter. The next one would be to enable our Bluetooth service. So we'll type in system ctl enable Bluetooth and hit enter. And the next system I want to enable is our printing system. So I'll type in system ctl enable org.caps.capsd and hit enter. There you go. So let's clean up the terminal here and let's create a new user for the system. Let's type in user add dash m capital G, then wheel for the group. It has to do with the pseudo privileges. We'll check this in a second. And then the username, in my case, my name, and hit enter. Now let's give a password to the user. So we'll type in pass wd and hit enter. Enter the new password and retype it. Now let's give this user pseudo privileges. And to do this, we'll type in editor equal nano and then by sudo and hit enter. Now we need to scroll down here the file until we find the will group we talked about before. And there are two of those and we need to select the one which has all equal all all and we need to uncomment this line here. And that means now every user who is member of the will group will have sudo privileges. Now we can hit control O and enter to save the file and control X to exit the editor. And now we are ready to exit the system and return to the ISO installer. So we'll type in exit. We unmount all the partitions by typing in U mount dash A and hit enter. And now we can reboot the machine by typing in reboot and hit enter. So I'll pull up here my virtual machine and let's have a look if grub was installed correctly. And as you can see, it's installed correctly. So we can go ahead and boot the system up by hitting enter here. And we are now on the login prompt. So let's log in with the user we just created. So I'll type in my name and my password. And we are logged in into our installation. So the first thing I'm going to do now is to install OpenSSH so that I can go back to my previous terminal. I do this now separately because this is optional for you guys. So to do this, I'll type in sudo pacman-s OpenSSH and hit enter. Enter my sudo password and go ahead with the installation. There you go. And I clean up the terminal and start the service by typing in sudo systemctl start sshd and hit enter. And I'm going to enable also the system by replacing start with enable and hit enter. There you go. Now I need to find out my IP. So I'll type in IP space A and I have an IP ending with 127. So let me go back to the terminal. And I'll type in, in here SSH hermano at 192.168.122.127 and hit enter. Accept the fingerprint, enter my password, and I'm in my installation. So let me clean up the terminal. So the first thing we need to do is to check for our IP. So we'll type in IP space A. And as we've seen already before, I have an IP ending with 127. And that's because, again, I have a cable connected to my PC. But if you don't and you have Wi-Fi right now, then you can type in NMTUI and hit enter. Then go to activate a connection. And here you will see a list of networks. You can select yours, enter the password, and you'll have an IP as well. So let me log out from here and clean up the terminal. And we can proceed by installing our graphics driver. So we have scenarios for Intel card, AMD card, and Nvidia cards. So in my case here, I'm on a virtual machine, so I have also a virtual machine driver that I can install. And I'll do this by typing in sudo pacman-s. And my package is xf86-video-qxl. So I'm just going to hit enter here, enter my password, and proceed with the installation. And this is done. 
Now, if you have an Intel card, it's very simple. You would replace QXL here with Intel, unless you want to install the Cinnamon desktop environment afterwards. So there is an issue with this driver and the Cinnamon desktop environment, which causes the desktop to freeze sometimes. So the ArchWiki doesn't recommend to install this package if you want to install Cinnamon afterwards. In this case, you're not going to install anything as the Mesa package, which is already installed, is going to take care of that for you. If you have an AMD card, you can replace Intel with AMD GPU. This is the open driver for AMD GPUs. And if you have an Nvidia card, then it can get a little bit more complex. So for newer cards, it suffice to install these two packages. The first one is Nvidia and the second one is Nvidia dash utils. Then you can hit enter and have your drivers installed. And this will work for most of the new Nvidia cards. But of course, there are exceptions, especially for all the hardware. Let's have a look at the Arch Wiki about the Nvidia cards. So I'll pull up my browser here, which I already prepared. And let's scroll through and see some information here. So first of all, the Arch Wiki warns that it's not advisable to install Nvidia drivers directly from Nvidia website because they will not be updated. So it's better to install them through Pacman as any update comes to the package manager and your system will be always up to date. And the first thing what the ArchWiki suggests is to find out which card you are using. So to use this command here to find out which NVIDIA card is in your system. And then to find the code of the card following the NuvoWiki's codename page. Or you can look also through the NVIDIA legacy card list and also by visiting the NVIDIA's driver download site. Once you define the model of your NVIDIA card, you can go ahead and find out the drivers you need. So as I said before, from cards which are from 2010 and later, you can install the NVIDIA package. That's going to be fine. And if you are using the LTS version of the kernel, you might want to install NVIDIA-LTS. There is also a suggestion here. If those packages are not working, we can also install the drivers from the AUR, which is providing maybe a newer version with my work. Although in most cases, NVIDIA or NVIDIA LTS should actually work. Now, if you have cards that are from around 2010 and 2011, you need to install the NVIDIA 390XX DKMS package from the AUR. So in order to do this, we need to install YA first, and we're going to do this in a second, but you just need to know where to find these packages. And of course, I'm going to put the link to this wiki in the video description below. And if your card is older than those ones, so it's released in 2010 or earlier, then we have to have a look at the unsupported drivers. So here things can be a little bit more complicated. So for unsupported drivers, as it says down here in the section, NVIDIA doesn't provide any more drivers for that. And this is very important because it means that these drivers do not work anymore with the current version of Xorg, which is the display server. So if you want to use the latest version of Xorg, you have to use the Nuvo driver. But if that doesn't work, you can still install all drivers for the NVIDIA cards, like for example this one, the NVIDIA-340XXDKMS package from the AUR, which supports those cards but doesn't support the latest version of Xorg. And if you have NVIDIA cards which are even older than that, there are no drivers packaged for Arch Linux. So let's close here the window shortly. And let's see how we can install actually packages from the Arch user repository. So let me first delete this command. The first thing we need to do is to install YA, the YA helper for installing Arch user repository packages. And if you remember before, we installed Git, which will help us download YA. So let's type in git clone and then https colon slash slash aur.archlinux.org slash YA dot git and hit enter. Now we created a git directory here, so we need to move in there. So we'll type in cd and then ea and hit enter. And then we can make the package by typing in make pkg si and then package build all capital letters and hit enter. We need to enter our sudo password and hit enter and proceed with installation here of the dependencies by hitting enter. And this is going to take a moment now to download and compile the package. So I'll be back when it's done. So now we are ready to install YA, so we hit enter, and YA is installed. So now we can just type in YA-S and the packages we are looking for in the Arch user repository. So one of those NVIDIA packages that are in the AUR, you can download them and install them with this command. And clean up the command here. And this is it for the base installation on a UEFI system. Now from here on, we can build our desktop environment, and this is what is going to come in the next videos. I'm going to number this series. This is going to be video 1A 
base is stored on a UEFI system. I'm going to make also one B for the MBR systems. And then I'm going to number the desktop environment videos, for example, with two, three, and so on. I'll create a playlist where you can always choose the video you want to go through once you have the base install done. So this is the base install of the UFI system. I'm going to release also the one for the MBR system. And then, as I said before, I'm going to release some other videos about desktop environments and also window managers. So if you have any questions about the video, please guys, let me know in the comments below. I hope you liked the video guys. If you did, please hit the like button below and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Subs always helps us out. And if you want to support the channel, you can visit our Patreon website or you can donate via PayPal through our website as well. Thank you so much for watching the video guys and I'll see you soon in the next one.